Happy Mother's Day. 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 Happy He is awesome. That um, that she is a veterinarian. Mm, her loves me and her's cute. Tickles me. She's funny. Um, she likes tells jokes sometimes. I like that. Keeping care of me. Bad times. Being a mummy. Nothing. So when I fall down, she can't fold me back up. She is not very good at playing the violin. Um, I already know because I listen. Nap and clean. She like calls somebody or talks to my daddy about stuff. A lot. Hi there and happy Mother's Day. Every year we like to celebrate the mothers in our church and even though we can't be together we will still want to do that this year. This year we have a raffle and with the help of my friends we're going to pick out eight winners. So listen close and see if you get called. The first one we have is Katina Zenobi. McKinney. We've got Marietta McKinney. <laughs> Kim Christie. Lori Bailey. Yay. Teresa Rogers. Melissa Beasley. And Lori Rowland. Well, I was just thinking about my mom on this Mother's Day. And sweet lady, I owe you so much. And I know you're up in heaven today, and, and I hope you're listening. Well, thank you, Mom, for the memories of life that you have always trusted me with and shared with me. Thank you for the smiles and the laughter and the, and the tears, and it seemed like, Mom, you always cared. And thank you for the values that you've shared with me all these years. And Mom, it grieved me a lot to see you go away. And I think about you every day. So mom, today, this is for you. And it's for all the moms who has given so very much. And this is a list today of, of IOUs, which is long overdue. I owe you so much for all the things you have done. Mom, I owe you for night watchman services for lying awake at night and listening to the cries and the coughs and me toss and turn. And knowing, Mom, that you could be there in a split second right beside of me. And Mom, I also owe you for sacrificial giving. I remember when you stood and ironed clothes for people in this community, when you really didn't feel like standing. But you've done all this so that your baby boy might cruise Andrews on a Saturday night with his buddies and have some fun. If you worked real hard that week, I might even have a real treat 
of having a hamburger at D. Witt Sharp's restaurant. Mom, I owe you so much. You gave so much, and you gave a lot. And I owe you for cleaning services, Mom, for, for the daily scrubbing of, of face and ears. Which, Mom, you've done a lot of it by hand to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And Mom, I owe you for the very, very frequent dusting of a young man's britches to make sure that he stayed in line. As I look back now, Mom, I realize I probably needed a whole lot more of that. Because, Mom, you never spared the rod. But you had an eye of an eagle and the roar of a lion. And mom, your heart was always as big as a house. You done so much for me in my life. Mom, oh, you and dad for taking me to church. Every time the church doors was open. And mom, I remember y'all took me, you just didn't send me to church. And I thank you for that. And I know now that that was all to lay down a good, solid foundation for which to build a life on. And you've done all that for me. And Mom, I, 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 I owe you for medical services. For nursing me through the mumps and measles and bruises and bumps and spring fever. For nursing me through all the hard times in life. And Mama wouldn't want to ever forget to, to thank you for medical advice. Important things like, if you don't quit scratching, it ain't never going to get better. And when you, if you don't quit walling your eyes, every time I ask you to do something, they make it cross that way. And if you don't stop eating green apples, you might get a bellyache. Thanks for drying the tears of childhood and ironing out the problems of growing up and helping mom heal the pains of puppy love. Mom, I owe you so very much. I owe you for the hard work that you've done. We never had much money, but we had lots of love because of you. And mom, we never went to bed hungry. And we never had designer jeans. And we never had Nike shoes. But I always remember that what we had, we were clean and neat. And it was always ironed because you wanted us to look our very best. Mom, I remember how you was. You ironed everything. You ironed our socks and our t-shirts because you wanted us to look our very, very best. Mom, you worked very cheap and you never complained on a very low income. And Mom, I owe you for bodyguard services. I was always afraid of the storms, but you used to hold me close, Mom, and, and talk to me. And now, Mom, I'm 72 years old, <clears throat> and I still tighten up when the storms of life come. But I remember what you always told me, that Jesus would never leave me, that he'd never forsake me, and he loved me so much. And that even in the midst of the storm, he was always there to protect me. Mom, you were always cementing our family together that we might be able to stand against the hard times and the shocks and the blows which mom you knew would definitely come our way thank you mom for the special occasions like christmas and birthdays thank you for making make-believe come true on a very limited income and mom i owe you for construction work for building kites and confidence and hopes and dreams. And somehow, Mom, you kind of made them all reach the sky. Mom, I owe you for 
cooking and baking. I remember the time, Mom, when you hadn't even eaten because you always made sure that we were situated at the table before you ever sat down. And I remember that there was two pieces of apple pie left. And me and my brother Dale was eyeballing those pieces of pie. And suddenly I saw you smile as I've seen you smile a million times before. And you said, you suddenly decided you didn't like apple pie to start with. Wow, what a mom. <laughs> I love you, Mom, for teaching me how to care about other people. I remember the time when a, a friend of ours died in this community, and she had four small children. Mom, you was there all the time, cooking and ironing and getting those kids off to school and doing everything you could possibly do to help that family, and you asked nothing in return. You done it all, Mom out of a hard love and I thank you for that mom you you loved your family you loved your grandkids you loved your church and you loved your community and mom I think you loved everybody so mom I owe you so much and I can stand here today and 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 go on and on about how much I owe you and what you've done for me. And I know, Mom, that I could never, ever repay you for what all you've done. You've done so much for me. You gave of yourself, your time, and your effort. And, Mom, you never complained. But I know you well enough to know, Mom, one thing. I know that you would mark this bill, paid in full, for just a little kiss in four little words, I love you, Mom. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Galloway, and I'm a member here at uh, Marble Springs Baptist Church. And uh, I'll say the prayer. Father, uh, Father God, we come to you today to uh, praise and worship you and to uh, 
to thank you for being our, our, our God. Uh, <clears throat> our God that only wants good for us, that uh, leads us and guides us. And uh, Father, that uh, we, ho- we, uh, we have value to you. And Father, I pray, uh, I pray for our families, that uh, pray for your presence in their life and that your will be done. And, and Father, uh, I thank you for them too. I thank you for what you're doing, what you're doing in our in our family's life and in our church. I pray for our pastors and uh, the leaders of the church. I pray wisdom for them and discernment. And I pray that uh, I pray that uh, we can soon get back to. Uh, regular worship service and uh, Father I pray for uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ I pray for peace and comfort joy I pray that uh, they'll take your word and put it in their heart and that they'd have it for uh, when they needed it for strength and uh Father, I thank you for uh, for everything that you do. I just thank you for your mercy and your grace, for the blessings you give us every single day. And uh, in your loving name, amen. Happy Mother's Day. Hope you all feel special today. Um, let me pray and we'll, we'll worship in song. God, thank you for today. I pray that uh, we can just lift our hearts to you in worship. God, that you just, um, you just help us to desire you, help us to want to be closer to you. And uh, just thanks for all these, uh, all these moms. We pray that they would feel special today, they would feel loved. And uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, I'm my cross, I've taken all to leave and follow thee. Destitute, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my all shall be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought.
storms may howl and clouds may gather, all must work for good to me. Splendor and majesty, strength and beauty be unto your name, O ancient of days, your holy. We tremble before your throne, our hearts prepare. Come and adore, ruin before your glory. And great is the Lord, most worthy of all praise. Great is the Lord, most worthy of all before your throne, our hearts prepare you, we come and adore, ruin before your glory, and great is the Lord, Lord. Welcome back to Children's Church. Today we are on our third week of our series on the fruits of the Spirit. So far we have covered love and joy, which means this week we are on peace. The Bible talks about peace several times, but I want to read you three verses that I have for you today. The first is Psalms 19, 165. It says, Those who love your teachings will find true peace. Nothing will defeat them. In Isaiah, verse 3 says, You, Lord, give true peace. You give peace to those who depend on you. You give peace to those who trust you. Also in Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 10, says, The mountains may disappear, and the hills may come to an end. But my love will never disappear. 
My promises of peace will not come to an end, says the Lord who shows mercy to you. Now you may be wondering, what is peace anyway? Well, peace is when God helps us to be calm no matter what the situation is. And I know right now, you're probably not in school, you're probably stuck inside a lot more than you usually are, and you're not able to see your friends like you used to. And a lot of change can be scary. But if you put your faith in God and depend on Him, He can give you peace. Now, I want to remind you that the fruit of the Spirit isn't something that we can do on our own. But if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit does those works in you and creates the fruit of the Spirit so that you can have love, joy, and peace. Before we watch our video about Peter, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day, and thank you that we can worship together, even though we're in separate places. I pray that you would give us peace during this time, help calm our anxieties or any fears that we may have. I pray that we would learn so much from this lesson and that we would learn how to be more like you, and that people would see your love in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, guys, I want to remind you of the challenge we have going on and just to encourage you to memorize the fruits of the Spirit. And if you get them all, send in a video to the church's email, and I've got a surprise for you. All right, click on the next video. See y'all later. To everyone who's lost someone they love Long before it was their time you feel like the days you had were not enough when you said goodbye. And to all of the people with burdens and pains keeping you back from your life, you believe that there's nothing and there is no one who can make it right. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken hearts. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. For the marriage that's struggling just to hold on Lost all their faith in love And they've done all they can to make it right again Till it's not enough For the ones who can break the addictions and chains Try to give up but you come back again just remember that you're not alone in your shame and your suffering. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. You just cry out to Jesus, cry out to Jesus. To the widow who suffers from being alone, wiping the tears from her eyes. For the children around the world without a home say a prayer tonight. There is hope for the helpless, Rest for the weary and love for the broken hearts. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. There is hope for the helpless. Rest for the weary and love for the broken hearts. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. Jesus, cry out to Jesus, cry out to Jesus, cry out to Jesus.
Good morning and thank you for worshiping with us today. As we get started, I want to just thank uh, the mothers, for, especially for watching, and to wish you a uh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, there was a little boy and his dad who uh, went into a candy store, and the little boy had never been into to a place like that, and he was just amazed by all the rows and rows of candy and all the choices. And his, his dad told him, he says, son, you, you can pick out anything you want in the store, and I'll buy it for you. Well, he was so excited. He ran through that store looking everywhere, up and down. He'd, he'd see something on the shelf. He'd pick it up and look at it, and he'd say, that's my favorite. That's my favorite. And then he'd throw it down because he'd see something else. And he just went through the store all over the place. And, and it finally became apparent to his dad this boy could not make a decision on what kind of candy he wanted. And the dad kept hurrying him and hurrying him. And, and the little boy just couldn't make up his mind. There's just too many choices. And finally, his dad just got a little upset with him. And he, he took him by the hand. He said, son, we, we've just got to go. And, and they, they walked out of the store. Uh, with the little boy had tears in his eyes because he didn't have a piece of candy. He wanted every piece that was in there. He wanted them all. And he ended up with nothing because he couldn't choose just one piece of candy. You, you and I are a lot like that little boy. We're, we're faced with the challenge of making a huge number of choices every day. And with each of those choices comes a huge variety of options. And we really don't know what to do. We struggle with what to wear, what to eat, when to get up, should we get dressed today, who are we going to vote for, all kinds of crazy things that we have to decide. As a matter of fact, um, psychologists say that the average person can make, to, make up to as many as 35,000 decisions in one day. Now you know why you're tired. 35,000 decisions in one day. Good or bad, right or wrong, you are where you are and who you are in life because of the choices you've made. Now, for a small number of people, you're where you're at in life because of somebody else's poor choices. They've chose to do something to you that harmed you, and I am so sorry. I, I just I can't imagine what that would be like. But, but I want you to know that regardless of where you are in life, no matter how bad it is or how much you have messed up, Regardless of how you got to where you are today, tomorrow can be better. Tomorrow can be better and there can be a new normal for you. You see, our Father in Heaven, He specializes in bringing dead things back to life, in transforming the messed up, in making old things new. He promises that those who seek Him will find Him. He promises that those who call out for guidance and wisdom will receive them. He calls out and says that the broken can find healing and the hopeless can find hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. I've shared this verse every week for the last four weeks. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. What that text tells us is that God has something wonderful for us. He's prepared something unbelievable for those who love Him, for those who walk with Him and live for Him. God has something special. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God declares that, He says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And then Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10 says that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus went on and He says, but I have come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. You see, God has a plan for your life. He's promised you a new quality of life. A life filled with abundance that's only possible through Jesus Christ. Joshua, the leader of the Israelites, as he, he was getting ready, uh, giving his farewell address to the nation. He had led them into the promised land. And, and he called the people of Israel to make a decision. He says in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14, he says, Therefore, fear the Lord and worship Him in sincerity and in truth. Get rid of the gods or the idols your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt, and worship the Lord. But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, he said, choose for yourselves today which will you worship, the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. As for me and my family, he said, we're going to worship the Lord. You see, Joshua was saying that the quality of life that you and I can experience is determined by the choices that we make. 
This week, I uh, sat at my computer and I googled the question, what is the most important decision that I will ever make? And, and of course, you know, thousands and thousands of potential answers came up. The, the most common answer, the first most common thing that we have to figure out is, who are we going to marry? It seems like every article said that was the number one choice you made. Evidently, the person you marry determines the quality of life that you're going to experience. Second thing that he brought up, the articles brought up, was that your second most important choice is what you do for a career. How will you make money? What will give your life meaning and purpose? And then the third most important question that you have to answer is how am I going to live life? And I think that they were talking about physical and emotional health, about the people you associate with, about the rules that you will follow. Now, I agree that all three of those are important decisions that you have to make and, and that we all will end up making them. But I don't think that they're the most important decisions that we have to make. The most important decision that you have to make in life is whether or not you're going to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Everything in life and in the afterlife depends upon this one decision that you have to make. We were created by God to live in relationship with Him. But we rejected His authority over our lives. We deliberately chose to sin against Him. And as a result, our relationship with Him was broken. The Gospel declares, however, that those who receive Christ as their Savior and surrender to His Lordship over their lives can have their relationship with God restored. John chapter 1, verse 11 says, Jesus came to His own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. The second most important question that you have to ask, you have to ask and answer is, will you pursue intimacy with God? Will you choose to abide in Christ? John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Intimacy with God comes as we spend time with Him. Time in prayer, time in His Word, worshiping Him with the saints, serving Him in the church, and seeking His face privately. As we practice those disciplines, we grow closer to God and we find the desire and the power and the guidance we need to experience the abundant life promised by Jesus. So the first decision we have to settle is what are we going to do about Jesus? What are we going to do with Him? And the second one is, are we going to pursue intimacy with God through our faith in Jesus Christ? And then there's a final thing, a final decision that we must make, and it's simply this. Will we choose to work towards Christ-likeness? Will we choose to work out our salvation? In the book of Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, he says, Therefore, my dear friends, just as, you, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purposes. Now, Paul isn't saying that you and I should work for our salvation. You can't. It's a gift from God. But he is saying that we should work it out. The term is an agricultural term, and it encourages people to get the most from the harvest. He's saying that we should cultivate our salvation. Don't be content with what you have. Work for more. God has so much more for us than you and I are experiencing because we're not working out our salvation. As we work out our salvation, God works in us, giving us the desire and the power to live a life that pleases Him. Now, we're in a series of sermons, a series of messages, where we're working towards a, a new life, a new normal for our lives. Each week, I've given you a, a simple principle from God's Word that if applied to your life, will get you closer to the abundant life God has for you. In the beginning of the message, the first sermon, I talked about how we need to define what that normal would look like. And what I simply said is that God's desire for you and I is that we live for His glory. And then I said that we glorify God best when we live a life and have a ministry that looks like the life and ministry of Jesus. In other words, what I was saying is that God's will for us is that you and I should walk like Jesus. And then in the next message, I shared with you that if you want to walk like Jesus, you have to walk with Jesus. You have to know Him personally and then pursue intimacy with Him. And finally, then last week, I shared with you that when you came to faith in Christ, God gave you everything you need 
for life in godliness. A new normal is possible because of what God has done for you. Now today I want to share with you our next principle from Scripture, and it's simply this. Our personal transformation is dependent upon God doing His part in our lives and upon you and I choosing to do ours. Now let me, let me just try to unpack that just a little bit for you. First is a part that God has already done for us. Think of them as the gifts that He's given us. And then second, there are the choices that we must make, the work that we must do, not to earn our salvation, but to experience more of what God has for us. As we choose to do our part, God starts working His work inside of us or within us. What I'm saying is that our choices facilitate God's transforming work in us. Now, the first thing I said was that God has already done His part. And He's, and he's given us these, these gifts or these blessings. The first one is that He's blessed us with the gift of His Son, Jesus. Not only has He redeemed us from our sins, but He's restored our relationship with God, and He's given us an example of how you and I should live. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God proves His own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Second, God gave us the gift of His Word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God has given us the gift of His Son. He's given us the gift of His Word. The third thing He's given us is the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. I said it earlier, but when the Holy Spirit moves into our lives, when we come to faith in Christ, the Spirit of God moves inside us and brings with Him everything that we need for life and godliness. The fourth gift, the final gift that God gives us is the gift of the church. Now, if, if you and I have learned anything in this pandemic, it's simply this, that we need community, that we need one another. We need companionship, but we need more than companionship. We need people who will hold us accountable, people who will spur us on to love and good deeds, people who see the best in us, who know what God can do for us and push us to that point. Hebrews 10, verse 24 says, And let us consider how we might spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, God has done His part. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness, and yet many people are not experiencing the abundant life promised by Jesus. Why is that? It goes back to the choices that we've made. What did you do with Jesus? Is He your Lord and is He your Savior? What did you do about pursuing intimacy with God? Are things like prayer and Bible study and worship and service, are those things a part of your life? Are they this, this, is the supreme passion of your life to know God more and to know Him more intimately. And finally, are you working towards Christ-likeness? You can't be content where you are spiritually. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that it's time for a new normal. It's time for a change. And it only come when you and I wrestle with these three questions. And specifically today, I want to talk about that third one. Are we pursuing, are we working out our salvation? Are we striving to be more like Christ. Uh, open your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. We, we were there last week, and we looked at the first four verses. And, and I want to come back and pick up where we left off last week. Uh, Peter is writing to Christians who have received Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. And as a result, God has given them everything they need for life and godliness. He's blessed them as well with several promises rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we pick up the text, 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 5, the Apostle Peter writes, and he says, For this uh, very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and is short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. So let's look at verse 5. Peter says, For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. 
First of all, there's that phrase, for this reason. And it just, what, it's a literary device. And what Peter is doing is he's connecting with what he just said to with what is about to follow, what he's just going to show us. And he's saying that because Christ has given us everything for life and godliness, and because he's given us promises rooted in the gospel, we should choose to live lives that are pleasing to God. Now, let me be clear. Again, it's not a call to earn your salvation. It's a call to respond properly to the salvation we've received through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a call to worship. And, and, and then Peter next, he says, not only is this for this reason, but he states that believers are to make every effort to carry out the commands which follow. He's calling us to make a choice. He, he's saying to passionately pursue the development of these virtues that he's going to show us that follow in a response as a response to the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. Growth in the Christian life doesn't just happen. There's no magical prayer that you can pray that will usher you into a new normal. It takes work. It takes hard work. And what Peter is saying is because God has blessed you with salvation, He blessed you with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to make every effort to supplement, to add to your faith these qualities, which he's going to show us in a minute. We must choose, in other words, to work towards Christ's likeness. He continues in verse 5 by admonishing us to make every effort to supplement or add to our faith certain, certain virtues. Love, moral excellence, wisdom, self-control, endurance, godliness, love for the saints, and sacrificial love for the lost. These virtues are so important that Peter writes in verses 8 and 9, he says, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Now, Peter says several things there, so let's just go back. First, Peter says that these qualities should be growing or increasing in our lives. They're like a muscle. You've got them, but you've got to exercise them. You've got to pursue them. They need to become important to you. Second, he says that as these qualities increase in your life, they will keep you from being useless or unproductive in God's kingdom. As you seek these virtues for your life, you become of great value to the work of God in the world. And God expects his children to bear much fruit. The third thing that Peter points out is why some people, some believers are not pursuing these qualities. First, he says that they're blind or short-sighted, unable to see their true spiritual condition or able to see the future which God has promised for them. They're trapped in the moment, focused upon the day and its troubles or the day and its pleasures. Second, he says that, that they have forgotten what Jesus did for them upon the cross. They've forgotten the terrible price that Jesus has paid for their forgiveness. As you and I reflect upon what Jesus has done for us, as the Spirit moves us to go back to that place where our sins were paid for, paid for the Spirit will compel us to walk like Jesus, to live our lives differently. Now today, I, I want you to understand clearly that God has so much more for you than what you're experiencing. He wants to make this day the best day of your life. As a matter of fact, he wants to make the rest of your life the best of your life. The question is, are you ready for a new normal? The quality of your life, the quality of life that you experience is determined by the choices you make about how you answer these three questions once again. What are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to receive him as your savior and allow him to be Lord of your life? Are you going to pursue intimacy with God? Are you going to make prayer and Bible study and worship and service and seeking His face a priority for your life? And number three, are you going to work out your salvation? Are you going to work towards Christ's likeness? Now today, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to make a decision. First, if you haven't received Jesus into your life, if you haven't asked Him, to save you from your sins, if you haven't surrendered your life to His Lordship, I'm asking you to do so today. I'm calling you to make a decision for Christ. Acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Acknowledge that you're destined for hell without Jesus. And then, believing that Christ is the Messiah, that He can save you from your sins, ask Him to forgive you, to cleanse you of all your unrighteousness, and to give you the strength and the power 
to live a godly life. Second, I'm asking you to make a decision to pursue intimacy with Christ. What I'm saying is that, that I, I, want to, uh, I want to challenge you to set aside each day time in your schedule for prayer, for Bible study, for worship, for time for you to seek the face of God. Will you choose today to make that a priority in your life? Now, next week, we're going to look at that topic and we're going to figure out how we do that. But today, I'm asking you to make that commitment. And finally, I'm asking you to decide today, will you strive towards Christ-likeness? Will you confess that you're not where you're supposed to be spiritually? And will you commit your life to becoming more like Jesus? Will you choose life today? Now, whatever decision you make today, would you let me know? On this page, there's a button that says connect with us. Click on that button and let us know about the decisions you've made today. Or if you want, you can email us. Our email address is prayer at marblesprings.org. Listen, we, we want to pray for you. We want to resource you. We want to help you live out the decision you've made today. But one of the one of the most important things about making decisions is that you've got to let others know that you've made that decision so they can resource you and hold you accountable. Thanks for joining us today. Let me pray for you as you wrestle with what God is calling you to do. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy, for giving us the gift of Jesus. I thank you, Father, for the gift of your word, for the Holy Spirit that lives in us. I thank you, Father, that you've made it possible that we could become more and more like Jesus. And Lord, today I believe that your spirit is challenging us, prompting us, calling us to make a decision. I pray, Father, for those watching today, that many would choose today to receive Christ as their Lord and their Savior and to follow him in baptism. Second, I'm praying, Father, that men and women and boys and girls and teenagers all around the United States, they would decide today to pursue intimacy with you, that they would choose to dwell in your presence, to abide in Christ. And finally, God, I'm asking your spirit to prompt those of us who are followers of Christ to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God, I'm asking you, your spirit, to challenge us. If we're not where we should be spiritually, if we're not where we could be, Holy Spirit, point that out, convict us, show us that we might confess our sins and repent and turn from that sin. Father, I pray that anyone who's made a decision today, they would click on the button to connect with us or send us an email so that we might help them. Father, we thank you again. I praise you and thank you, Father, uh, for this wonderful day. Pray your blessings upon the mothers in the crowds. And Lord, may we... Uh, honor them today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We've come to the tithes and offering part of the service this morning and over the last couple of weeks I've really been thinking just about the crazy time that we're living in uh, where millions of people are out of work people even with essential jobs are operating at a reduced capacity uh, times are tough normal life continues to go on and just the pressure that it has put on people and a couple of verses came to mind this week while I was reading. And in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says that the Lord is at hand, or in other words, at, at our side. He's close to us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I got to thinking about that. And even what little that we can do, and those of us still work, and what a greater, there's no greater opportunity than right now to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to be able to help those who are in need. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 16 and 17 
starting with the second half of verse 16. It says, They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessings of the Lord your God that He has given you. So we're going to pray and uh, just ask God to bless the offering this morning. The needs are great, and but God is bigger than any of the problems that we're facing and, and able to multiply this just as He did with the loaves and fishes. So let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come before You. Dear God, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to come before You in prayer, the opportunity to get together even through the means of this online service to worship You. And I pray that You will receive our, our praise and our worship, dear God, with open hearts, that You will be blessed, that You will be satisfied and pleased with our, with our worship this morning. Dear God, I ask You to just take control of the situation, give peace and comfort and encouragement to all of those listening this morning, dear God, that they will be encouraged and find hope through this service this morning. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we would like to remind you that the Annie Armstrong offering will be taken up throughout the end of the month and we'll go towards that, uh, that annual offering. Thank you.